are working on warm up six nine. I actually don't have anything to stamp except for the warm up, but we're out of order. So the warm up to, that I'm stamping is six six. The other thing I wanted to mention was we've got not much left for this unit. So we have one more quiz, which is Tuesday. I know you have Sadie's and a lot going on this weekend, but make sure that you do prepare for a quiz on Tuesday on harmonics. I have the link there on campus, which shows you what assignments you want to study. So there was a harmonics concept builder, and there was a harmonics lab that we did through simulation. Those are good things to prepare this for this quiz. The test is the Tuesday after that, so that's the 15th, um, to wrap up this unit. So there's not much left. We're going to spend the most, the majority of class on the speed of sound. So you should have collected your data. And we don't have the material, so with your data, you're going to calculate your period and your wavelength. And then you're going to graph it. Um, and then we're going to analyze it. Okay, so... One thing that's missing in your speed of sound lab, go to number 13. At the very bottom, it asks you to calculate how long it takes, but they don't give you enough information. So I'm going to have you add this piece of data to that. So for number 13, let me just pull up that question. It says that you're at a baseball stadium and you are going to use your calculated speed, so the speed you get from the lab, to determine how long the delay would be when you see the batter hit the ball and then hear the crack of the ball. So you need the distance to calculate that. The distance I'm going to give you is 150 meters between the batter and the fan that's standing in the stands. Okay? So add that in. We should have enough time to finish this lab today because your homework and your only homework is the CER. And the CER is what is the speed of sound. And so this lab is the basis for that CER. And I want to have time to do the analysis of it. We're just going to go over waves in general. And I already went over this with you. So I don't want to take too much time. But sound waves... Um, are what type of waves? Longitudinal. And they travel faster in what type of mediums? Solid. High density or solid mediums. So I'll take that. That is different from other types of waves, though. Okay, so sound waves are unique. Most waves travel slower in high density mediums. Sound waves travel faster. And they travel as compressions and refractions that vibrate the air particles and therefore vibrate your eardrum. So that's how we hear sound. Now, when we are talking about harmonics, and this is important because guess what? Your quiz on Tuesday is on harmonics. So we went over these patterns already, but I'm going to go over with you, them with you again. So the harmonics we've been working with in the lab were one open end. The harmonic that we have here are two closed ends. And every harmonic, regardless of what it is, has a pattern. Our, um, let's just focus on the fixed, two fixed ends. How much of a wave is this? Vincent? A half of a wave, not a full wave, and a lot of students think that. This is my first harmonic. Now, if I wanted to go to my second harmonic, how would I draw that? Alec? Like a sideways S. You would do it sideways S. Good. So I have a sideways S. I'm going to complete it as a standing wave because harmonics are standing waves. But I want you to notice something. If this is a guitar string, the length of my guitar string is going to stay the same. When I go to the second harmonic, the length stays the same. So it's pretty obvious that as you increase harmonics, the notes and antinotes increase. 
But what happens to the wavelength? What happens to the wavelength? It decreases. Because this is half a wave, and that's a lot, and that's pretty long. And if this is a full wave, then it decreases. So here's our equation. Wavelength equals frequency, or sorry, free, velocity equals frequency times wave. The wave of a string or the wave of sound doesn't change, the speed doesn't change. But if my wavelength decreases, what happens to my frequency? Increases. This was in your quiz. They're inversely proportional. And so if that increases, what happens to the pitch? The frequency increase, Mason? The frequency and the pitch are directly related, and so pitch also increases. That's how we make music. So, in our lab, let's focus now on one open end. In our lab, you've got a node and an antinode. This is a quarter of a wave, right? This is half, so this is a quarter. If I were to draw, okay, I'll have a volunteer come up. Can I get a volunteer come up to draw the next harmonic here? What would the next harmonic look like? Oh, I wish this wasn't so high. I, I could, but I have the answers. Unfortunately, um, oh, they're going to pop up if I do this. Okay, Alec, what is it going to look like? Uh, or actually, maybe we'll, I'll have you draw it here. So this is my water. This is my tube. And you can draw the next harmonic up. Or do you want? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. So this is my next harmonic, and I'm going to put it up on the board, and I, I like it when you reflect on it as well. Yeah. So it'll look something like this. First of all, you always have, in one open end, an antinode at your open end. So Alec drew his antidote at his open end. So um, if I had the next harmonic, it would look something like this. In fact, and this is a good thing to think about in the lab, the wave actually goes beyond the top of the tube. So when we're measuring our wavelength as the water up, there's a little source of error because these sound waves or these harmonics actually go even slightly um, higher than the top of that tube. So we might see that difference, although there might be quite a bit of error as well just from measuring, right? So this is our, um, we actually call this the third harmonic when we have open ends like this. It shouldn't affect your questions in the quiz, but instead of first, second, we, for open harmonics, we go first, third, and then the fifth one, and I'm just gonna put it up here for you. This is the third harmonic, and this would be the fifth harmonic. So it, it increases in this way, and maybe musicians know better than I do, but when you have one open end, it always has this one three five pattern because of the fact that it doesn't create kind of a nice half wave. It creates quarters of waves. Question. So the thing that's different between those two is how much is underwater? Not underwater, because the water actually creates the end. Mm -hmm. So it's how much of a wave fills the uh, from the water to the top of the tube. So and what's changing between the two? So what do you think is changing? Sam? 
the frequency is changing, but more visibly, what is it, Alex? The wavelength. So notice this is a quarter of a wave. The quarter of a wave is pretty long. Now, if you fit this three quarters of a wave here, your wavelength is going to be much shorter. And then even more so, now you've got a full wavelength. If S54 is stopping here, and that's even shorter. So that, it decreases. That far with our highest frequency. Exactly. So high frequency, small wavelength. That's your inverse relationship, right? So let's go ahead and get, and get into... Um, Oh, into our speed of sound lab. Your lab, I believe everyone collected their data and you got your frequency and your length of tube minimum. So you, you're going to calculate your period, which is one over frequency, right? You're going to calculate your wavelength. How can you find your wavelength? Length by four, because this is a quarter. And then you are going to <laughs> graph a wavelength and period graph. Okay, room 306, please. When you print these, question. <laughs> Yes. So the reason why I'm doing wavelength and period is because it's a lot easier to see what your units would be and relate it to um, what the meaning of the slope is. Notes to take, because guess what? We've got a CER. I know it's your favorite. And the CER is focused on the speed of sound in, um, in air. So this is where you're going to get your evidence. Some of you have really good data just within your group yourself, and some of you have values that aren't so close to the speed of sound. That's the reason why we put a class data chart together, because if your data's off, you want to have evidence that is better. And you can talk about source of error, but really you want to you you want to have evidence that proves the speed of sound and not that the speed of sound is 500 or a negative value but that it's actually 340 meters per second or close to that so really quickly i'm going to go through these slides and then we'll go back to our speed of sound lab um so this is your cer I give you a lot of different options as to which lab you can use to prove the data, but I for sure want you to use the sound in a tube lab or the speed of sound lab that we did as at least one piece of evidence. And um, to be honest, Miss McGarry created this and she said you don't need a source of error, so you don't even have to use sources of error, although. Um, there are quite a few places where you kind of make some mistakes here. So talk about it if you'd like to, but you're not going to get docked if you don't. Um, this is going to be due, and it's your only homework. It's going to be due next Thursday, so you have a little under a week to do it, two class periods. But I want to make sure that you are doing it this weekend because a lot of students that put it off forget a lot of the stuff that we talked about and a lot of these points are going to be really important. So first of all, we've got a bunch of um, speeds of sound here. If we're talking about the air temperature, um, sorry, room temperature, it would be 343. If it's cold like it is today, it's going to be slower. And I think our data showed a value that was pretty um, Pretty close to 331, it was 320 something. So we've got a cold day. Air's gonna travel slower on a cold day. So 343 is actually what we're looking for. And then let me go back to our actual speed of sound data. So 325 on a cold day is really, really accurate. Okay. Um when you are writing out a mathematical model, 
You always want to write it out with a symbol. So wavelength is equal to, at least for this one, 325. What are my units for the slope here? Meters, because it's my unit of rise over run. So this is time or period in seconds. So it should be meters per second times the period plus I 0 0.00, or sorry, minus 577 um, seconds, or this is meters. Okay, here it's pretty obvious because that number is so small that I'm going to have to drop this. Were there any groups that dropped their y-intercept? Any groups that actually decide to keep their y-intercept? And that's fine, too. Okay. So for those groups that decided to keep their y-intercept, I want you to think about what this y-intercept means. And so in your um, lab analysis, it asks you, what does the y-intercept mean if you were to keep it? Yep. It's telling you that you have some number, um, let's say it's uh, five meters of wavelength with a period of zero seconds. It means that you can have a wavelength travel in zero seconds, but does that make sense? No. So even if you thought, or even if your data showed you should keep your y-intercept, common sense should tell you that this is not possible. Okay? And then obviously, you should have noticed that because this is a meters per second value, this is a velocity, and it is specifically the velocity of sound. Question off? Just like the zero zero, Yeah, good. Good, uh, really good point. Alex suggested add zero zero as part of your data, and because you know conceptually that it makes more sense that way, it'll make your data even more accurate in terms of the slope. So that's a, a good point. Any questions on this? Okay, so your CER is your only homework tonight. I dropped the concept builder. You're welcome. For um, decibels, um, it's not a huge um, important topic for this unit. So what I really want you to focus on is the CER. We're starting the earthquake lab. You, um, we're supposed to do a pre-lab analysis today, but we're not going to do that. And then um, beats and wave interactions. Um, I do want to show you, instead of doing the demo, at least show you what it looks like. So any questions on the CER before I show you a few videos on waves and wave interactions? OK, Chase. <laughs> Okay, so there are a lot of properties of waves that provide a lot of um, useful resources. Um, one is the fact that sound waves reflect, and actually all waves reflect, but specifically the use of sound waves reflecting, we hear it all the time. They're echoes. And uh, certain animals like bats, dolphins, and even submarines use echolocation to uh, make sure that they're not bumping into things when they're under the water. That's how they see through echolocation. The um, other thing that echoes are used in is in medical devices. So you can actually see heart pumping through, or blood pump pumping through your heart using echolocation. Um, and, you know, it's a way that doctors can look into your body. I know specifically they use it for analyzing the heart and looking at arteries, but, um, 
they they can do that without actually cutting into people with echolocation. So it's a really great technology and tool that's used in um, medicine and in science. Acoustics, obviously we've talked a lot about music, but acoustics is related to the fact that sounds are going to interact with each other. When you have a concert, multiple instruments playing at the same time, you specifically arrange the different instruments and the people and the concert hall so that the waves are gonna interact in a constructive way rather than a destructive way. And so music venues are designed really specifically so that you can have some nice acoustics. And um, when you don't want acoustics, kind of like that echo sound, then they have things called, um, they have like specific rooms built to absorb the interaction of sounds. So I have a video just to show you what acoustics look like. And I want you to look at this room here. I have another video that um, is a lot longer, so I won't probably play too much of it. But notice how these walls are angled. The angle of those walls allow the sound wave from her trumpet to go into the wall and then bounce up and down toward the angles rather than back out as a reflected wave. So it actually absorbs the sound and um, you're gonna be able to hear that when she's in a normal room versus this room. So you can hear a lot of that echo and acoustic. This is with no echo. As soon as she's done playing, you hear nothing. Okay, so the next one I'm gonna show you is the world's quietest room. And I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but notice the room that he's in is very similar to the room that that, um, that saxophone player was in. The quietest place on earth is apparently an anechoic chamber in Minneapolis. Now I'm here at BYU at their anechoic chamber. Anechoic is Latin and basically means no echo. And the way they achieve no echo is through all of these foam wedges which are put on the walls and even the floor. You can see that I'm actually on a spring floor and down below me there are all of these wedges. Now you may want to use headphones while you're listening to this video because that's going to be quite important. Low frequency sound will come in and by the shape of it bounce and just keep bouncing pretty much forever until it just gets lost in the wall. And then high frequencies are more so going to get absorbed into the foam itself. You can hear how the room deadens echoes by clapping constantly while closing the doors. You can see the echo here as it follows the clap and it gets shorter and shorter as the doors close. There are reports that it's impossible to stay in one of these rooms and remain sane for a significant period of time. The record is apparently 45 minutes. I felt a little claustrophobic. I, got, I felt like there's a lot of pressure on my head. Well, why would that be? I mean, the air is no different in here. What I figured is just because when you listen to the normal room, there's a lot of reverb. To your ear, that means there's a lot of space. But there's none of that in so just claustrophobic. It feels like you're in a tiny room, like you're, you could be in a coffin. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really an anxiety response. So you're used to having these sounds around you, and then you don't anymore, and so you start to panic because you don't have something you're used to. And I think that anxiety can increase and cause some stress. And maybe that's why people 
go crazy or hallucinate with sounds just because they're trying to make up for what they're used to that isn't there. When I bring people in, I warn them, hey, if you get a little dizzy, please let me know so I can um, get you out of the room before you make a mess in, in our expensive facilities. <laughs> <laughs> First, you'll hear any rustle of your clothing, so you move an inch and you'll hear it. Then you'll hear any fluids that are in your mouth or your throat, you'll hear them all moving around every time you move your mouth. And um, the longer you stay there, the more you go. So you start to hear the blood flow through your brain. Have you heard it? Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of like a ringing or a pulsing. Can you kind of make the sound for us so that we know what the sound is? Of the blood flow? Yeah, it like, sounds like a pulsing. Like, some people say they can hear a heartbeat coming from their chest as well. Have you heard that? Yeah. A violinist placed in one of these rooms was apparently banging on the door within a matter of seconds trying to get out. Now other people say it's impossible to stand up because you've become so disoriented, dizzy, nauseous, and uh, and some people even hear oral hallucinations. But to me it doesn't sound right. You know, I believe that I should be able to sit in a room with no sound, with the lights off for as long as I like. And so I'm going to put myself to the test by staying in this room for as long as I can. So I'm going to forward this because it literally is just him in the room, but I want you to hear what he um, describes yeah, it as. Just me. Not that. Uh, otherwise, you know, there is a sound of like, there are people who find all sorts of situations really uncomfortable, like just being a... He stayed in for an hour. So he stayed in for a long time. So those types of people would find this kind of unnerving. I definitely noticed that there were a lot of noises. Like it wasn't just pure silence. Like I actually had to work hard to make things feel silent. Um, otherwise, you know, there was a sound of like just me rubbing my beard, or um, or just like the rustle of your clothes, or every time you swallow when you breathe. Perhaps the weirdest thing I noticed was like my sense of my heart. I just felt like it was pumping really hard, and uh, and I could feel almost like the blood pushing up. Me. It wasn't like I was hearing it, it's just like I was feeling it. And I was feeling it though, in a way, my heart was shaking my body. That was something weird. Um, but besides that, nothing really crazy, no, no weird uh, hallucinations or anything like that. So I think the, the myth that you can't stay in here for longer than 45 minutes is that uh, it's busted. You know, this is not been busted, I, I still think it's, it's not good. So, um, I actually would love to go into a room like that, but it's really cool the way everything's so quiet and we don't notice it because, you know, the sound of the wind and things, we kind of, you know, tune it all out um, until you're in a room like that where really, truly, every all sound is absorbed in the walls and you can't hear anything else. I want to talk about another cool technology, which I know a lot of you have, so I'm going to skip all this. But how many of you have noise canceling headphones? Okay, so noise canceling headphones use destructive interference um, in order to cancel out sound. So basically, the noise that comes in it takes that sound wave and it reflects it, so that the um, reflection of that wave and these show it as transverse waves, but the reflection of those waves actually end up canceling. So. Um, that's the technology of constructive and destructive interference with sound waves. Um, next class, I'm going to talk about this stuff right here, which is basically the interaction of waves where you can hear high volume and low volume positions in the room when you have two speakers playing at different places in the room where there's constructive and destructive interference. So you'll be able to experience that. Um, but for now, focus on sound waves and focus on, on studying harmonics for the next quiz.